Hey guys, are you going to this Tupperware exchange party that Geiger's hosting next week? Based on the Evite he sent out, sounds like it's going to get pretty wild. Yeah, it looks pretty solid. I'm excited, but I'll probably keep it pretty tame for the night. I'm going to DD for the night, so no drinking for me. Oh, why don't you drink all you want? Just park your car in a space whale. He'll take us home. Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast, where we are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and watching TV and movies. I am your host, the Mayor Jeff Hornacek. Thank you for joining us for our review of Ahsoka, Season 1, Episode 5, titled The Shadow Warrior. We are joined tonight by the mad scientist Brian Banner and the American hero Nate Thurmond to review this episode as we do all of our TV episodes using the four Bro Four Squad criteria, which is the acting the story, our favorite scene in the episode, and then any theories or questions that we have going forward. All right, Banner, you uh, probably want to get the first uh, say in on this one. You've had a full chub all day. Surprised you can even stand straight with all the blood rushing to your dick. What do you think about the acting in season one, episode five of Ahsoka? Did anyone show up that was noteworthy? I mean, no, pretty, pretty just average. Except for Hayden Christensen, my fucking God. It's crazy yeah. what he can do when he actually has a good director directing him, right? Mm-hmm. I was going to say, do you think George Lucas watches this and just goes, fuck? <laughs> Damn it. He's got everyone, to. Everyone shit on it. I mean, we know Natalie Portman and Ewan McGregor are great actors, but like everyone, like Hayden Christensen got like buried in Hollywood. Yeah. And he was pretty fucking good in this. Mm-hmm. The way that he was able to seamlessly go through Clone Wars Anakin, which he's never played before, by the way, yeah. and Darth Vader back and forth was just incredible. I don't know how he did it to, yeah, to the, play two characters at once and like molding them together that way. It was incredible. Incredible yeah. job. I think I think I had most of this and well, some of it in, in plot, just the way it played out. But <laughs> Anakin's character arc in this one episode was so much more than like some sometimes people fit in a whole fucking like season of television. It was <laughs> phenomenal right. and he crushed it. Yeah. It's it awesome. something too like I know that he, the the teen angst and the way that it was written that he was going through in the prequels is like really where people take issue with it. Like he just actually says his emotions like I am in love with you. I am sad. But here there was like so much behind his eyes. Like when he mm, was looking at yeah. Ahsoka no, no matter what he was trying to emote, whether it was like yeah. reluctance to train her or like th- really just the burden that Anakin felt like I need to teach this kid about like murdering people, which I'm going to get into in best scene. But that or then like the anger. But this time when he showed the anger of Anakin, you actually felt like he was a scared kid who was trying to compensate for that. Whereas in the prequels, he just seemed like he was bitching that like his parents took his cell phone. You know, it just. It just felt like he had matured as an actor, and as a result, the character was just so much more fleshed out. Yeah, agreed. And uh, one other note, just on him in general, whatever. They're well, doing, I like, wish, like, I, I sorry, think there's some I think delay there. Okay, uh, go Nate. You can finish up. I was just gonna say, de aging on him looked great. It was fantastic. Whatever their technology is at this point, it was awesome. Well, it was yeah, interesting I could, because I they, were kind of, they were kind of going back and forth, right? So, like, in when mm-hmm. Ahsoka first goes up there, he's, like, how old Anakin was when he died, basically, right? I would assume. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay, so yeah. either way, they're de-aging him then. But then they de-aged him even more for mm-hmm. the Clone Wars scene. Yeah. So it looked look solid. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on Syndulla in this one? Hera Syndulla. She's fine. Yeah. Yeah, she, I mean, yeah. I think I may have said this on when the last one I was on. Yeah, she's kind of the glue that's holding everyone together at this point. But I think it's – I mean, she's filling her role fine. Um, nothing spectacular. But, like, it's it's uh, it's driving things home and it's it's moving along the plot from, like, her point of view as a general. 
Um, but I like like her kind of rebelliousness that's kind of sticking out now is, is kind of interesting. Isn't it funny that the Rebel Alliance all of a sudden hates someone who's rebelling? <laughs> kind of <laughs> ironic, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit hypocritical, <laughs> isn't it? And what's our fucking name again? <laughs> oh, oh, damn it. Right. You got me. You're no, don't rebel like that. <laughs> <laughs> rebel like we want you to. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of a <laughs> like, funny note. Can I be the douchebag who says that Evan Witten, who's playing Jason, is just I mean, I've definitely seen worse kid actors, but like this is the kid we got, really. It's not yeah. working for me. Yeah. Yeah, it's it is a little unfortunate. I mean, he's not He's uh, not horrible. No, and I, well, he's definitely not good. I've seen way way worse. But he it is, is kind of the line. It is kind of rough given like what they're giving him for the plot now and like the potential for what he's doing. So pick it up. Maybe he'll pick it up in, in episode six. Having Maybe he needs that, to go back to acting classes. Um, I'm trying to find the name of the actress who played teenage Ahsoka. She was great. Ariana Greenblatt. Jesus, she was fucking good. And you know why she looks familiar? Because she was in 65 and Barbie. I thought it was the same chick. Oh, she was in 65. Oh, oh and that chick. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, shit, I had no idea. I didn't either. She is really, really talented. Like, buy stock in her right now. Like, this is where Jenna Ortega's stock probably was like a year and a half ago. Mm-hmm. Like, buy Ariana Greenblatt stock right now because it's about to blow up. I keep thinking you're going to say Ariana Grande every time. I do too. <laughs> that might be Greenblatt. That might be a good buy low stock, Ariana Grande, you know? Yeah. Can you imagine her playing Ahsoka? <laughs> no. I don't want to. <laughs> I'm good. How would you put that image in my head? Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, good, good call out there. She was amazing. Is there anyone else I'm missing before we move on to... I, I just want to give a quick shout out to David Tennant as Yu Yang. More specifically, he, at the very, very beginning when he tells uh, Hera, I told them to stick together, but they never listen. Like, the way that he delivered that line, and I know they kind of, you know, fucked with his voice a little bit, but the way he delivered that line and the emotion that was coming out of a droid mm-hmm. was absolutely fantastic. I know that has a lot to do with the um, visual writing at that point, but and the, and the visual, but yeah. his voice definitely hammered it home. I did say yeah. the scene when Syndulla is, like, sensing someone on the edge of that, like, facade of the rock cliff, and it's him holding... I think it was like the map or no, no, sorry. It was um, Sabine's helmet. Sabine's helmet. That was kind of like an, an iconic scene in the episode. I felt like yeah. that was really, really well done. That was not my best scene, but is an honor, honor, honorable mention. It was a really cool visual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's move Absolutely. on. Absolutely. All right. Story and plot. According to IMDb, Ahsoka confronts her past while Hera and her allies undertake a rescue mission. Nate, we finally got some very solid dialogue and character development here. I feel like this show has just been flying by so quick. Banner and I said last episode was basically just like an extended fight sequence. This one definitely slows down a bit. What do you think of the story? Um, it's fucking awesome. Like I can just I can just leave it at that, and like that's enough to <laughs> yeah. cover cover how well it was done. But uh, uh, Dave Filoni directed this one, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yes, man. Of came back. Fucking, they brought in the big boss for this one, and it paid off. Um, this man, episode, like, yep. just by the way, has a nine point five out of ten on IMDb. Bump it up! Wow, that eighty seven hundred votes. <laughs> Bump it up! Um, yeah, the, there's so much in this one, and yeah, the the reintroduction reintroduction of Anakin. Um, like I said a second ago, like his character arc, because like. She first goes in the world, world between worlds, and sees him again. He's kind, loving, accepting, and then as it progresses, he obviously gets more aggressive with it. But trying to teach her a lesson, um, and I think the main thing they're trying to teach her is like you can't just be passive and like set set by the side, sit on the sideline. You're gonna have to be a warrior. You're gonna have to be aggressive. You're gonna have to go and fight for what you want. Because she's obviously kind of like, oh, do we want to go find Ezra? I don't know. I don't want to do all this warrior shit and fight. So, like, that whole arc and the things they go through, them bringing in real-life scenes that you've seen in Rebels into this is fucking amazing. Like, Ugh. they're like, the first battle they're at, they were, the second one was the Battle of Mandalore, which mm-hmm. was the, even awesome. Like, the shit that they get into after that is insane, but just, like, that little snippet of that. Knowing she was at the Battle of Mandalore, interacted with Rex, 
Um, God, it was, there's so much. It was amazing. Ben, I'll, I'll throw it over to someone else to blab for a minute. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is the, really the first time that I 100% felt like this was Ahsoka's story, right? Yeah, this yeah. has been really towing the line between Ahsoka's story and Rebels Season 5. It's almost a Rebels Season 5 through the eyes of Ahsoka until this episode. Um, This was the episode that, regardless of what happens the rest of the season or even prior to that, this, I would say, first half of this episode is what we wanted. This is what everybody wanted. They wanted... Mm -hmm. Ahsoka to confront Anakin and confront her fears and her grief and her regret of leaving the Jedi Order, more specifically leaving Anakin and her effect on him, how much effect she had on him going to the dark side. And if she was still there as his pad one, would he have done that? And yeah. this was kind of her confronting that. And um, it was kind of like, like a therapy session for her. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, they have a really interesting dynamic because, like, both of them have a lot of regrets, right? Ahsoka effectively left the Jedi Order in no small part because Anakin, like, was reluctant to support her and believe her in maybe her most trying time as a Jedi. Yeah. yeah. And then Ahsoka certainly feels like Anakin's turn to the dark side was probably because she abandoned him in some small way. And obviously he has abandonment issues or, like, loss of uh, loved one issues, like, between his mother, his fear of losing Padme, and I'm sure Ahsoka like leaving the Jedi Order played into that. So they both kind of feel like, yeah, we we both kind of fucked up and for them to have that closure in this was pretty incredible. And like something at least I was not expecting when this series started. Um, so it was kind of like a very pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess the last thing I'll add here. I thought I had something on here. Um, didn't really didn't really expect them to like really dive into Jason's abilities yet, but that was, that was kind of cool. Like showing obviously Kanan being his, his father, but they're really pushing on that button now um, as far as like what he could be or what could potentially be in the future. So um, that'll, that'll tie into one of my theories later. And on, how but. fucking cool is it that he was listening to the waves and could hear the lightsabers? That like cool. that. Yeah. That audio editing with the music, the waves, and then the lightsaber all like piled on top of each other, mixing, but you can still hear all of them. Incredible mm -hmm. job, whoever did the the sound editing for that that scene. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure this isn't a coincidence because obviously Felonius, big uh, Star Wars fan, but Jason spells his name <clears throat> J A C E N, and in the Legends books, that's actually how Leia and Han's son Jason spells his yep. name as well. So maybe either an homage to that or just kind of like a riff off of the force yeah. sense. Yeah, I bet that is a little okay. homage, a little, little nod, a little tip of the cap. That's nice. Good job, Dave. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, we're going to move on to best scene. Let's do it. Is there one? There's a lot here. I it's mean, kinda, it, 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 it it's just kind of like weird. where you separate the scenes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the entire first 45 minutes of the episode, of a 15-minute episode. <laughs> um, I wrote down... You guys will probably take one of these, so I'm just going to get in first and cut you off. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, but I thought the specific piece of dialogue that I really like between Anakin and Ahsoka, and there are a lot to choose from. We probably just do like a top ten Anakin and Ahsoka conversational moments in this episode. But it was the one, I think it, I don't know if it was after the Siege of Mandalore or that first Clone Wars scene that they showed mm -hmm. where um the clone troopers were like laying on the stretchers and ahsoka was clearly having like guilt over yeah. you know the loss of life being a little bit on her hands and anakin basically explains to her how like unfortunately the role of the jedi is changing like they've gone from peacekeepers to now effectively soldiers and he's saying that like we need to understand that like our role in all of this is not what we want it to be but it's what it has to be right now and ahsoka was really like struggling with that. And, and she was almost seeing like, yeah, this is calloused you over too. Like you're not the same Anakin that I knew a few years ago. And he's like, no, I'm not. And I'm not necessarily happy with that. Uh, I just thought that was like a really interesting moment where they're both being very honest, or at least Anakin's being very honest about like, yeah, I don't like this either, but like, this is the situation. It sucks. And we have to just sack up and do it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was a good transition. That I, I think that was the first their first battle there. I believe that, that was the first one because that was yeah. between, uh, yeah, that was that was him and Young Ahsoka, which was just again fantastic fucking acting in that, all the all, top to bottom. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was the first step towards like her acceptance of getting into that warrior mindset. And yeah, we're supposed to be protectors, but like circumstances changed. So we have to do what we have to do for the greater good. And um, but yeah, it was a, it was a very good kicking off point for her acceptance and her accepting of the her new role that she needed to be in. One thing I'm just kind of thinking of, and I love Ariana Greenblatt's performance in this, but do you guys feel like a little bit cheated that some of the key emotional moments for Ahsoka in this entire series weren't given to us by Rosario Dawson? Like the uh, I'm going to tentatively say yes, but I think there is a lot of meat on the bone still um, for later on in the season. Uh, with everything between her and Sabine, I yeah. think... I think that effectively her training, uh, Ahsoka's training was complete in this episode by Anakin. Um, her going to the world between worlds is, is I took it as it's kind of like her entering the cave on Dagobah. You're facing your greatest fear. Her greatest fear was Anakin, right? Mm -hmm. Because of, of everything that went down. And so she faced it and that was her completing her training. Just like Luke did on Dagobah when he faced Vader, Anakin, same fucking thing. Um, so I think there's a lot of meat on the bone now for her to, uh, translate what she had learned down to Sabine, um, in these final three episodes. Yeah. yeah and I guess it makes more sense, especially canonically to have Anakin and, you know, teenage or younger Ahsoka have that moment because that's literally when they knew each other. Sort of like yeah. her kind of age. Yeah. All right, Brian, what was your favorite scene? My favorite scene was the lightsaber battle, but more specific between Anakin and Ahsoka, but more specifically the ending when um, Anakin basically goes from Anakin to Darth Vader. His lightsaber comes out fucking red and <sighs> that God, fucking flash. Yeah. The overlay it, was that's fucking the image so, of the series. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fucking insanely incredible. good yeah. uh, visually. And then just just emotionally too. them battling her, obviously getting the upper hand, having the chance to kill him and not, you know, essentially I, I choose life. I don't want to kill. Um, just an incredibly powerful scene, incredibly powerful. And it kind of shows how they've both, they both were faced with the same challenge as far as, you know, the Jedi order, what they're doing is fucked up. It's a, it's a weird ass cult that we're in. And there are two paths to go. You can go Anakin's route or you can go Ahsoka's route to to sidestep and get away from the Jedi. And then those two are kind of coming back together at a head in that scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when Dave Filoni like conceptualized that shot in his head, he was like, well, I'm a fucking genius. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, you know, he walked into the fucking room and just flopped his big dick on the table and said, look what I thought of. Oh, I rewound it right away just so I could see it again. <laughs> it was... I don't know. I can't even describe I, it. It was so fun. Once we get like the like, you know, uh, novelty bias a little bit out of the way, we're going to have to de decide whether that or the Rogue One shot of Vader in the hallway, like the silhouette of him just murking people. What's uh, I almost compared it to that. I just, know. Uh, yeah. I was like that. It has, it's like on the same level. This one just had like such an emotional uh, through line that it like really was just like the crescendo of that. It th Like mm -hmm. that kind of gives this the advantage, you know, like. Yeah. It's the cherry on top of the Sunday that we've been fucking waiting for, probably since we started watching Star Wars, really. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. And, like, especially just with the season, I think I said something about it earlier, like, Ahsoka's just been so laissez-faire about everything and, like, actually going on the journey that they needed to go on. And this was the final push and the final training that sent her over the edge. And, like, it just – the symbolism came across any any actual conversations. They just melded together so well. It just pushed it forward in the most perfect way. It was awesome. Yeah. So I guess speaking of that, Nate, is your best scene also something with Ahsoka and Anakin? Or do you want to go with Yeah, this? it's funny because I can kind of just take the meat of the sandwich since you guys took the bread on the eggs. <laughs> um, uh, and the the scene at the Battle of Mandalore. Um, and not just because of what it did for this episode. Like if you've seen Rebels – what you know like that scene is and like the culmination of that and what they're fighting off and right after that that's when ahsoka goes and fights um, darth maul in that scene and you know the culmination like order 66 order 66 is coming up and 
it was it was so awesome. That was like the last thing to really push them into the final scene that Brian talked about, um, and really just accepting that she needed to go on this this journey. Um, but then, yeah, and then I think I said something earlier. We got our first interaction with Rex, um, so we saw him and Ahsoka interacting as well. So first live action Rex that we've seen, um, and it just all came together so well, and it was. Now, right. according to the the cast list, it said Tamira Morrison was the voice of, Re- or at least we mm-hmm. played Rex, which I thought was interesting. I always wonder, especially because of Filoni's um, involvement in the animated series, because the person who voiced Rex in the animated shows, Clone Wars, and I'm assuming Rebels, that guy's really, really good. But it's mm-hmm. not Tamira Morrison. I always no. wonder, like, if he feels pressure to like get those people back for the voiceover roles, or if it's like, well, this is live action now, we have to go with the live action. That's a yeah. That's an interesting call out. It's uh, kind of been split down the middle at this point, yeah. right? Probably. Yeah, I mean, Katie Sackhoff is the one that he's done both with for sure. Yeah. And others. And then uh, the guy that did that plays Zeb, he also did both. The yeah, the live action Mando. The live action, yeah, he was in Mando for that cameo, which I'm starting um, to think we're not going to get him now. I guess Fennec, yeah. but Fennec went the other way, right? She was in uh, Boba Fett first, and then. Yeah, uh, bad batch. <clears throat> yeah, Ming not win. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 But yeah, basically all of our best scenes were just one elongated, broken up yeah. scene. So again, the first thirty-five minutes of the show, but very, very core element. I also thought too, it was really important as far as like an editing perspective to have the Sindula storyline. Now, granted, it's nowhere near as interesting, which nothing would be as Ahsoka and Anakin, but it did sort of help like move them along transitionally to have like a little breath in the, in the action every once in a while where we cut to her and like what was going on on the planet. I thought, Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, there, there's times if, if that scene was one elongated scene, it would get kind of diluted and it might honestly as badass as it was. And the content that was there, it might lose a little bit of my attention just because it, yeah. there's, I have to yeah. focus for so long might like get mental f- fatigue on it. So they did a great job. Yeah. Breaking it up that way. It's like the crust on a pie. Like you eat yeah. it for the pie filling, but you need that little <laughs> yeah. crust on the bottom to get a little texture change. Exactly. All right, we're going to move on to theories and questions. This could get a little bit interesting here. Let's get it. Yeah, I've got. Right. A, I've got a question. All right, Brian, why don't you go first? Has anybody called Child Protective Services on Hera? Why? I mean, she left her kid with an irresponsible robot at a location where somebody was known to be murdered. But he's a friendly robot. Yeah. I guess. <laughs> and to be fair, that murder like just happened, you know. Yeah, she's you know, she she also told him don't go too far. So oh okay, my bad. Great I parenting. That part. Cut the cord, Brian. Great Jesus. parenting. Uh, speaking of Jason, did they just like subtly drop that Kanan was his dad, and I was supposed to know that until now? Uh, Rebels. Yeah. So Jason is in Rebels. No. Them having sex is well, them Full penetration, yeah. <laughs> it's actually a deleted scene, I mean, but it's on the DVD. I don't know if you guys know this, but you can fuck and not make a kid. Well, allegedly, <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> because the timeline of maybe I'm off, but unless is she, does she like end rebels pregnant? Because I feel like, like the whole empire has been defeated, and this kid's like eight years old. I think it took longer than eight years, right? But maybe not a lot longer, but I do feel like he wasn't even. She wasn't even pregnant with him when Rebels ended. He is in the last episode of Rebels as like a toddler. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Well, but I, I, I took it as he was closer to like 12 or 13, maybe. But yeah. I may be completely skewed on that. Interesting. All right. Yeah. And I think that they dropped that line in there to let people know that Oh, his dad was a Jedi, so it makes sense that he is force sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people again, for for me who didn't see Rebels, I just didn't know if that was supposed to be like an oh shit moment or if this was like common knowledge among Star Wars fans. Because it really hadn't been talked about until now. I don't know if they wanted it to be sexual the force thing or like save it for a little reveal. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think even it's know that you would oh, know shit, who but yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a nod for people who made not yeah. Because in theory, if you've never seen Rebels, you don't even know who Kane and Jerry is, right? Yeah. So it's just like, oh, okay, so this Speaking robot of, said that his dad was a Jedi. 
Speaking of casting the voice actors in live action, give me some Freddie Prince Jr. up in this mug. He said he's he said he's out. He said he's not in it. Trust um, me, I've been waiting. I've been spoil- wanting. Skip ahead thirty seconds if you don't want Rebel spoiled for you, because I'm going to spoil it for myself. Is Kanan dead? Like, what? What's his status? Oh, he's yeah. dead. Yeah. Okay. Very, very dead. Yeah. Couldn't be deader. <laughs> you don't think Freddie Prince Jr. is pulling an Andrew Garfield, where he's like, "I'm the big, mm-hmm. I'm the big deal. I don't want." I, mean, I actually don't think he is. I really don't. Yeah. The only re- the only way I mean, it had obviously it had to be a flashback or like. They were like the world between worlds, or you're hearing like forced voices or something. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to see his face though. He made a comment a while back that he came back for Rise of Skywalker and did his little bit there for the end, and he said he's done. He's not coming back. Yeah, he wasn't. uh, He wasn't even approached for this, but he said basically along something along the lines of, "Filoni's my boy, so I came back to do Rise of Skywalker basically for him." to get my character in the movie and he's done with star Wars. Why is he, which done? I don't know what he's doing. I don't no. know. I don't know what else he's doing. Like, I don't think his schedule's filled up, but well, I, 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 sorry, go, go ahead. Horns. I was gonna say, even aside from that, he just seems like a massive star Wars fan. Like how do you ever say no to star Wars? Yeah. If, if any of the fans out there haven't seen his like two or three minute rant on like a, I don't know what podcast <sighs> it is, but I've watched it like three or four times where he like, breaks down star wars at such a deep level it's fucking awesome he should but it's give, so like, a simple at the same time on. yeah but he's like he's so angry through it too. Oh. Yeah. well you could tell he's just had to deal with so many fucking mouth breathers that think they're yeah. right it's like dude i've talked to the person who wrote star wars so shut the fuck up <laughs> <laughs> and i worked extremely closely with essentially the guy that created the universe in yeah. filoni i mean at this point filoni knows more about it than george lucas because it's like, George Lucas has been involved with, at this point, like, a, a very small number of Star Wars projects compared to Dave Filoni. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I mean, he did, he did obviously, the first six movies, and then I think he did four of the, four or five of the, of the and Filoni did all, he did the prequels, Filoni was on all of the animated shows, and now he's been on all the live action shows. Mm-hmm. And surely he was involved in in the trilogy sequel in some capacity. Right. Yeah, for sure. All right, Nate, what do you got? Theories, questions. Um, I'm wondering if there is a potential setup, and just off this last episode with um, Jason's abilities being shown and all that, potential setup for Jason being maybe trained by Ezra at some point. Um. Hmm. If and when they find him, I don't think it would be in this season. I think it'd be kind of down the road. Um, but obviously, he has a ton of interest in it, uh, especially when uh, he, uh, Yang, Hugh Yang uh, goes to show him a ship. <laughs> Can you show me the, the training? Oh, no. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> Will you train me? No. No. <laughs> no. Like, I'm not even going to get your hopes up. Just stop. Yeah. So he obviously has a ton of interest in that. Um, so maybe a potential setup for something like that being being brought in down the road since Ezra was trained by Canon. So I mean, they're definitely gonna I, do something with it aside from what they used it for in this episode of him, yeah, like, busy locating Ahsoka, right? Yeah. And the thing is, is they could have done this entire show without him being in it. So the fact that he's in it and he's been in multiple episodes now and had a fairly significant role, they are planting the seed for later on. They have to be. Oh, for sure. If not, if not, they're just fucking stupid. And to your like tongue in cheek point about like uh, Hera needs to be, you know, speaking with child protective services. It is sort of like clunky writing to have him. I mean, I understand like his mom is like disobeying an order from the Rebel Alliance. But like for her to bring him to the planet, it's like, would you really do that? But obviously there's a plot device reason for it, which again, Filoni could find another way for them to find Ahsoka under the water if he didn't have bigger plans for Jason. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. And then like the daycare is like on holiday for like a week or two. So she's got to take him to work. So what well, a kid do? got head lice. So yeah. the whole thing's closed down. Shuts it down. Sucks. Yeah. Had, there was a, had a shave a few kids heads. Wookie there got head lice and now yeah. everyone can't fucking go in. Tough scene. Yeah. And uh, I heard they were refused to shave that Wookie's hair. Well, it's a really good thing. It's a religious thing. You know that. You don't want to mess with yeah, that. I, yeah, you're right. Um, I have this is a theory slash question, although once I say this again because I didn't 
watch Rebels, one of you two will be like, that's fucking not the, the case. So good try, Horns. Um, is the place where uh, Ahsoka met up with Anakin a completely separate place between places or space between worlds than the one where Ezra and Thrawn are? Yes. Yes. That's Ezra and Thrawn are at a different galaxy. They're basically like in the Milky Way galaxy, as opposed to a galaxy far, far away. Okay, so and they're not in space like a, between. They're not in worlds. like a story type place. It, Anakin is in like a place to commune with the deceased, right? Yes. Yeah, the place they're at is basically like purgatory. Way more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. But to that point, Ezra and Thrawn are alive. Yes, if we allegedly. believe so. Okay. But the place they're trying to go to where they think Thrawn and Ezra are is a physical, actual place. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Are they trying yeah. to go to, like, a... Michigan. Sub- yeah, Michigan. <laughs> the basically. thumb of Michigan. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make, make sure, because this is the first time... I mean, Star Wars has shown Force ghosts and, like, the ability to commune yeah. with those that are no longer, like, in the realm of the living. But this, like, out-of-body experience that Ahsoka had, where it was like she took shrooms... I just wanted to make sure that that was a separate because I actually understand that pretty well. I think it's still the Thrawn and Ezra one, and obviously we haven't been there yet. But based on what you've said, I, that still really confuses me. But I think I get the place that she met Anakin in. It was basically like the Jedi, um, like waiting room to go to yeah. Jedi heaven. Yeah, like a purgatory kind of in between. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can explain it like that. In between life and death. That might be a l- oversimplification, but. I think it's serviceable. Yeah. And I'll just say one thing, and then I'll, you guys can say whatever you want. Um, I know I didn't watch Rebels, but the Pergils, like the whales, they're fucking stupid. They, Not going to disagree. <laughs> the The transportation part is a little weird, um, but up until that point, I, I'm fine with them. Yeah, if they, they did were, a lot. They Sorry, if they weren't used as Ubers, I was going to say, I, I, I guess I could let it go because it's just a weird Star Wars creature with a cool aesthetic. But the fact that they're like whales that also like galaxy jump, I just like, come on. The fact that you haven't seen Rebels, I totally understand where you're coming. There's a praying mantis on my wall right in front of me. It's freaking me out. Holy shit. Sorry. Yeah, I just looked up and there's this fucking praying mantis in my face. <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, uh, I think that... I don't even remember what the fuck I was saying now. So you haven't seen Rebels, you understand that. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. I totally understand where you're coming from. Once you watch Rebels, or if you've watched Rebels, I think your opinion might be a little different. They're still dumb, but you understand it a lot better. There's more lore behind it. I could do less with their blue butts. Yeah. Yes. Power them through the space, but yeah, they've got a, they've got an important role in things. That's all I got. So anything else you guys have? Um, I was too enamored with the whole episode to really think about any questions or theories. So I threw my one out and that was it for this one. Fair enough. I got one theory that I pulled out of my ass because, again, I was just so in awe of how well done this episode was. Yeah. Um, And I don't know that this can happen, um, but maybe it still can. I think Balin's apprentice is going to get killed insert however she gets killed here and sabine is going to become his apprentice for a short time oh and then there's going to be a throwdown in this where thrawn and ezra are there's going to be a throwdown um where sabine and ahsoka fight ahsoka is going to end up using the exact same move she used on anakin to get the upper hand and take his lightsaber and same thing, going to be there like she can kill Sabine, but won't. And that'll bring Sabine back to the to the light side. So you think Sabine, based on this, is going to like going to go full dark? I think there's a possibility. I think she feels betrayed by Ahsoka for leaving her. I think the whole reason, her motivations for going on this mission or adventure or whatever is to find Ezra. And Ahsoka made it pretty clear that that wasn't the goal. The goal was to stop Thrawn and to stop this next war from happening. So I think she's disenchanted with with uh, Ahsoka. And so 
Balin is just going to tell her whatever she wants. If, if yeah, you remember say, in episode four, he said just, something about do it for Ezra. The yeah, he already has started uh, that. <laughs> it basically like a ripoff of the way Palpatine turned Anakin, where he's like, if yeah. you don't do this, Padme's going to die. He'll just All you do is take like what the desperate person wants and you just offer it to them. Like, well, if you don't do this, then Ezra is going to get an anvil dropped on his head. She's like, well, I don't want yeah. that. Yeah. So... Banner, in your theory here, do you think this could all take place in this season or this would be maybe strewn See, out over a couple seasons? I don't. I. Yes. I. Th- <laughs> OK, <laughs> so it all has to do with time frames. One, the reason why it may not happen and honestly probably won't, unfortunately, is Ray Stevenson's death. Right. If yeah, that I don't think that's something that could get 100 percent fleshed out in this season necessarily um but i can also see this happening in we had an entire episode of ahsoka and how she's going to get to to ezra and thrawn so maybe we have an entire episode on the ship in transit to this place now where it's all morgan elsbeth and sabine and balin and that's where all the manipulation happens maybe episode seven real fast is when uh, I think Shin is her name. Uh, Balin's apprentice gets killed. And yeah. then Sabine is her apprentice shortly for an episode to half. The big ending is in, in the final episode is Ahsoka uh, winning that, that fight. Yeah. Again, it's kind of far fetched, but it's also plausible. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of room for development on the Balin and Sabine ship right now, since that was completely left out of this episode. And I think that Balin is going to be able to help Sabine if she is, in fact, force sensitive and can use the force. She's going to be able to because she's going to use the dark side. She's going to use her anger and Mm. all of that to be able to actually access the force or to use the force where she hasn't been able to up until this point with Ahsoka's. Yeah. And I think she's getting so frustrated with that that she's like, look, just tell me what I have to do because this is pissing me off. I mean, what you're saying, Banner, all makes sense. So if it does play out. I mean, it fits in with canon and all Star Wars lore, so it makes yeah. sense. I like it. I did, too. Yeah, I was also, actually really – that was that was probably the one I've been <laughs> most proud of all season. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> nice. Yeah, very solid. And also, to that point, I do feel like there are a lot of characters that aren't going to make it out of this show. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially. And they would yeah. still have a lot of options for, like, a season two of this. I could even see – I could see them killing Ahsoka, too. Mm, man. That'd be ballsy. I could... We riot if they do. Oh, yes, I would definitely riot. <laughs> in, be in the streets me? tomorrow. Yeah. But I anything? would not be surprised if it happens. Anyone uh, else have any theories and questions? That's it. No, that's all we got. Yeah, this one was where you just kind of like watch the incredibleness of the dialogue and finally getting to see Hayden Christensen get a chance to show what he can do as Anakin. And then at the end, you're like, oh, kind of forgot to even think about where this might go next because that was so satisfying. Yeah, just soaked it up. I soaked it up. Wow, look at us. Might be the best Star Wars live action episode of any episode. Of all the Mandalorians, of Andor. Mm, Yeah, I I mean... mean, I really Ahsoka, like the Ahsoka, Luke, episode. and Grogu together. Yeah, that was cool. That's up there. The Luke, I guess the end of season two of Mandalore when I mean, Luke that's yeah. just that's shows up. That was that's insane. tough to beat because mm-hmm. of the... But it's similar. It's that nostalgia factor. Yeah. Yeah, all good stuff. Yeah, God, the feeling we had when that happened was <laughs> pretty hard it was, to... I think I know the word is orgasm. That's what it was. That's the word. That was that feeling. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was insane. That's what that feels like. When that X-Wing <laughs> docks and you're just like, shut the fuck up. Did they I docked this? at the same time. hi <laughs> <laughs> Nice. All right, guys. Anything you want to leave the people with for Season 1, Episode 5 of Ahsoka? Nate, we'll go to you first. Uh, yeah, 1 through 4 was, was fine. Um, a little slow at points, and then this ramped it up. This is the turning point. Um, super excited for the rest of it. Yeah, this one... Uh, the show was good. This one, I think, gave us real hope for a pretty fucking epic last three episodes. Mm-hmm. Banner, what do you think? 
Uh, yeah, I agree with everything you said. Uh, also, make sure you guys tip your space whales. Good. <laughs> okay, here we go. Five star rating. <laughs> well, what if they're not five star uh, per gill ride? You know, I'm not. We don't just give those out. I mean, was the tongue smooth? Yes. A little, little too moist That's for five my, my taste, though. Yeah, he didn't give moist. me the ox uh, tentacle, though. <laughs> ox tentacle. <laughs> We're on fire tonight, guys. Really, we really are. Follow the shit up. The most corny jokes. <laughs> I love it. All right. For the American hero, Nate Thurman, and the mad scientist, Brian Banner, I'm the mayor, Jeff Hornacek. We've been the Bro4 Squad podcast. Thank you guys for checking us out. Uh, please join us for the last three episodes of Ahsoka Review. Pumped to see how this thing ends. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, pretty much anywhere you find podcasts if you type in Bro Force Squad as three separate words. We're also on Letterboxd with those same three words. We're on X, Twitter, and Instagram at Bro Force Squad. And check out everything that we post on our website, BroForceSquad.com. Till next time, I'm requesting a pergil. His name is Malik. And he is 11 parsecs away, he says. Ooh, I have time for another beer then. (laughs) God.